Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to this episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this episode I'm going to share with you my five top reads from 2023. All books which have left a mark on me and left me with certain memories as if I lived them. So without further ado, let's dig in shall we? I'm going to do the books in ascending order. So I'll start with my fifth favorite up to my first favorite of the year. And the fifth, in fifth place, is The Painted Veil by Somerset Maugham. Now, we read this in my Patreon group and it was well beloved by the vast majority of people. This book is poignant. It was a reread for me and it just never stops enthralling and capturing. I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you why I particularly like it. So the story is of Kitty and Walter Thane. Kitty is a classic socialite. She's been brought up as a girl of her times um, to be refined and to be able to flirt and to bring men, tease men along so that she can get a good match, as her mother says, and get into a, a significant position in life. But... She waits a bit too long, even though having many suitors, and in a rash decision, she decides to settle for a bacteriologist called Walter Fane. And they move out to Hong Kong, um, right out in the east. She doesn't really love Walter. She respects him to a degree, but he's boring in her eyes. He doesn't like the socialite life. He's too intelligent, and she thinks of him as aloof. And so the book opens with her having an affair. And as they're having an affair, phenomenal opening chapter, the doorknob turns and her and her lover freeze. Um, and from there, the story progresses. Now the story itself, and I do an in-depth review of this in Patreon, but the story itself is based around an idea of how her husband, Walter, can kill her, not through murder, but by taking her to where there is a typhoid epidemic on mainland China. And she has to go with him because otherwise there'd be an ignominious divorce. And don't get me wrong, Walter is not necessarily the bad guy. She certainly is not a likable character at the beginning, but it's how her experiences in the typhoid epidemic, separated from Western culture, reveals to her how little she actually knows about life, how little she understands the man that she had married, how little she understands the power of faith, how little she understands the differences of cultures and civilizations. One really striking sentence in this is, Kitty had a queer feeling that she was beginning to grow. It's such a small sentence and it comes about halfway through the book and yet so much is captured in the essence of that one line. It's a case study in how we are all characters of our culture, our environment. And I don't just mean broad Western culture versus everything else. Everyone has a culture and we often think that that is life, that is the world. And that's where the title of this comes from, it's from Percy Bysshe Shelley's um, poem where he says, lift not the painted veil. In other words, we walk around not seeing reality, but with a veil over us which has images inside it that we think is the real world. I suppose a modern expression would be, you know, um, the map is not the landscape you know, the reality of the world that we think we see isn't necessarily reality. But it's her wakening up to the realization, the lifting of the veil. It is a really moving account. Um, it's, you know, it's quite a somnolent book. You sort of drift through it. And there are intense moments, although it's extremely slow paced. Uh, by that, I don't mean boring but it's not a rip-roaring read. It's a genuine classic that makes you think. And I'll read you one tiny little snippet, which doesn't actually give anything away, even though it's from a, near the ending. This gives nothing away about the ending. I want a girl because I want to bring her up so that she shan't make the mistakes I've made. When I look back upon the girl I was, I hate myself. 
but I never had a chance. I'm going to bring up my daughter so that she's free and can stand on her own feet. I'm not going to bring a child into the world and love her and bring her up just so that some man may want to sleep with her so much that he's willing to provide her with board and lodging for the rest of her life. Like I say, that's not entirely what the book is about, but it's part of a realisation that she never had a chance in her outlook in life because it was forced upon her. That we're all somewhat victims of the way we are brought up and we unquestionably accept that it is true. That's how things should be. But how, when difficult circumstances arrive, when trials in life arise, our eyes can be opened and we recognise that we've not been walking in the real world, but we've been walking beneath a painted veil. In fourth place on my list of the five classics I enjoyed the most in 2023 is F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender Is The Night. Um, this book is truly moving. It's, it broods and flows at the same time. It reminds me of like the deep vibrations beneath a current of a river if there was some small seismic activity, you know? Um, it shimmers along, but there's an ominous sense in the background. Now I'll tell you the story roughly again and then add on why I love it so much. The story follows um, Dick and Nicole Diver. Now they're quite, uh, you know, they're socialites. They run a hotel, Hotel Gauss, down on the um, South French coast, and the Mediterranean coast. And the book starts with a, a young actress called Rosemary, who's gone to stay at this hotel because she's convalescing from getting the flu. And she does, she's there alone, and she meets a host of different characters who come onto this quite isolated beach. And she doesn't think too much of them. She's a very, you know, well-known actress, except she meets a dick and he's just charming. He's older than her, but there's something vivacious about him. The ability to, every time he walks past people and speaks to people, their personality just grows. And she feels that magnetism and charisma in him. And then she meets his wife, Nicole, who is beautiful in her eyes um, and everything that, you know, she would like to be. And she too has got a charm and verve about her. And they just seem to have this beautiful relationship with one another. And no doubt Dick and Nicole deeply love each other. But Rosemary falls for Dick and Dick is charmed by her. Now he knows what's going on inside himself and he does love his wife Nicole, but we slowly get the sense that something is not right within Dick and Nicole's relationship. And as the story progresses, you see Dick torn between these two women. Um, and it's not like a... Um, a covert love affair at all. Things seem to be quite open. But surrounding them are a whole, there's a whole tableau of characters who are small part players but so well drawn that it makes the whole feel live. It's like capturing your life in a picture frame. I don't mean as a photograph, but it just captures the essence, the most important parts of this moment in their life. Now, amongst those characters, you've got uh, an aspiring writer who wants to be an intelligent writer. You have someone who is um, an inveterate drunkard and can't escape alcoholism despite his best efforts. You have um, another person who also loves or, or, or has fallen in love with Nicole Diver, um, and he's a charming, I think he may be Greek actually, um, or Italian, and he's very charming, and he, kn he knows Dick and Nicole very well. But what's so brilliant is you then get the reveal of what the problem is in the background, and that not all is well with Nicole, and you get their backstory um, of how they met and how they came to marry, and then how things begin to fragment and pull apart. You also see Dick almost, I wouldn't say implode, but slowly crumble beneath the weight of all that he's been trying to do under his own emotions, his own love, his own passions. How the book ends is just absolutely wonderful. It's, it's poignant, like if you've read Great Gatsby, for instance, you know the ending is very poignant. 
Um, Fitzgerald's brilliant at this, but throughout, he talks with a lyricism. He talks with a, a soft poured poetry, a, you know, the velveted paw, which caresses you, but you know that there are claws beneath, um, if it so wishes to rip at you. And I'll just give you a little insight into one phrase, which is poetic, and then the moment when you sense something's not quite right. It's not giving anything away, don't worry. Just for a, just as an example of beautiful writing, just listen to this. It was a limpid black night, hung as in a basket from a single dull star. Isn't that lovely? This is, this is a moment um, where they've actually been on the terrace of Nick, there's been a party held at Nick and, uh, Nicole and Dick's place, um, a little soiree outside in a courtyard around a table. Um, that's where Rosemary, she says to him, I wanted, I wanted to know all of you too, especially you. I told you I fell in love with you the first time I saw you. I mean, you get this from the opening pages that she's going to fall in love with him. But whilst at the party, Dick and Nicole go inside for a moment upstairs. And one of the party members, Mrs. McKisco, she also has to go in. I think she's looking for the ladies' room. And when she comes back down to the, the table outside in the evening humid air, she's all of a, a flutter. She's all excited. And she says this. She exuded excitement. In the very silence with which she pulled out a chair and sat down, her eyes staring, her mouth working a little, they all recognised a person crop full of news. And her husband's, what's the matter, Vi, came naturally as all eyes turned toward her. My dear, she said at large, and then addressed Rosemary. My dear, it's nothing. I really can't say a word. You're among friends, said Abe. Well. Wow. Upstairs, I came upon a scene, my dears. Shaking her head cryptically, she broke off just in time for Tommy, who likes Nicole, by the way, arose and addressed her politely but sharply. It's inadvisable to comment on what goes on in this house. What did she see upstairs? What was the scene? That slowly unfolds in the book, and it's not what you expect. Now, I would say that Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night it's not the easiest read. It's a very slow read. And it's not written in order to thoroughly entertain you from, you know, the traditional plot with the character arcs or whatever shape arc you want. Uh, it's not got all the tropes of genre fiction, which are wonderful. But it's not a book for pure entertainment. It asks something of you as the reader. It asks you to invest a bit of your heart, a bit of life, to place yourself in the place of Nick, uh, Nicole, Dick and Rosemary at different points. Also, there's some comedy in it, but not farcical. A dead body appears at one point, but it's so in consonant with the book that it's brilliant. It doesn't go for light relief. It's not there for comedy's sake. Um, it actually makes a certain realism come out in life. The absurdities that sometimes happen to us along the way. I'll tell you how what it reminds me of. Imagine you went to a very, very luxurious um, hotel or restaurant, say the Ritz, and when you came to eat, you realised that, unlike everyone else, they had accidentally laid out a spoon for you instead of a fork. You know, it's not hilarious, hilarious, but it's inconsonant and makes things amusing. That's what happens with this dead body scene. Um, and yeah, it's just the playfulness of Fitzgerald is, is quite something. So that's Tender is the Night. Um, it's not a book I would straight out recommend unless people were looking for a certain kind of book. However, there are many parts of this that really got hold of me. Just to say before we carry on with the list, if you'd like to support my channel, if you want to get deeper into the classics and join a community that can talk about them, consider joining my Patreon. The link is below. So far, my Patreon has just been me giving some videos talking about books, but recently I've opened, well, this month, a Facebook page dedicated for my Patreon members 
where we're going to try and develop more um, of an interactive talking back and forth what everyone's reading, thoughts on the books as we're going through them. Um, and then hopefully, you know, even some maybe live discussions, who knows what's coming on, but you'll be helping me develop it as we go along. If you can't come to the Patreon, there is also a free Facebook that I'm setting up just for literature lovers, um, where you can, again, meet like-minded people, share what you're reading, listen to what others are reading. The links will all be down below. And now let's get back to my list of five favorite classics of 2023. Third on my list of five classic books I enjoyed the most in 2023 is a book that was the group read for World War November, if you took part in that. Um, and it's a book that I enjoyed when I was reading it and was moved by, but has grown and grown and grown in its thrall over my memory. And um, it is Testament of Youth by Vera Britton. This was a remarkable book. You know, it's, it's quite sizable, it's 600 pages. But the story, well, it's a memoir. Vera Britton, she, imagine living at a time in your youth, the peak of your youth when the world has just opened and the world collapses on itself. The world ends. That's the time Vera Britton lived in. She becomes a woman, she's ready to graduate into Oxford, the Somerville College, which is a big deal especially in 1913, you know, when war breaks out in Europe and everything changes. And the memoirs in this is quite rightly, it's so brilliantly titled Testament to Youth because she focuses her attention on the world around her, on the interactions of various ones who have got loved ones going away into the war, but mainly upon three main young men whom she loves dearly. I don't mean romantically. There is one she romantically loves. Uh, one is her brother and another one is a close friend of her fiance and her brother. And she tracks, she's got letters and diary entries which she's read back while constructing her memories, uh, memoirs. And she gives a testament to the youth of the day, the youth who lost their youth. It reminds me of Eric Remarks, All Quiet on the Western Front. We had just learned to love the world when we were sent into it to shoot it, to kill it. Um, and it's beautiful, it's uplifting, it's inspiring, it's thought-provoking, and it's tragic, it's soul-crushing, and it's poetic. She gives you her life before the war breaks out, and her love of literature and her desire to become a writer and a journalist and to go to Oxford, which is no easy task as a girl in 1913. But how she and her brother get accepted to places, how she meets certain ones, one in particular, Roland, who, whom she falls in love with. I mean, she remembers, there's a poignant scene where she remembers them going to cadet school and getting their honours as cadets because war is going to break out. And that was a beautiful high point in her life. Everything was perfect that day, that summer, she remembers it. And after that, they would end up going to war. But not only does she give you, well, she becomes um, sort of an assistant nurse, a VAD they're called. And she talks about how they're treated. She's, she's very intelligent, but she's not a qualified nurse and how people look down on that. She talks about how shy women were about men and sex and bodies, but then when you're catering or looking after, looking after caring for soldiers, where you have to strip them off, wash them, every part of them, where you have to see them in the throes of death, when you see them screaming in agony, when you see them shell-shocked, when you see them depressed and low, and the constant weariness of war, and how that changed the attitude, because the women and young women who came out of the war, of course, were no longer prudish. And also there was a, a hatred or a, um, an anger towards the institutions that the old world, which had set that war up and ruined their lives. Um, it helps you understand the change in the 20s to the roaring 20s, you know, the flappers and jazz and all that. But all the way through the book, all the way, she quotes bits of poetry written by many poets who went to the war, written by many women who had got menfolk in the war. 
she writes her own poems. She has poems back from her brother. She has poems back from the trench from her fiance who is so talented and yet at the same time so diffident about his own skills as a poet. And it finishes the book by actually spending quite a while after the war, how quickly the generation that was praised for their bravery was swept under the rug by government and politicians and even the public because they didn't want to hear about the war anymore. And a new generation came up and they felt abused, the ones that had gone through it. They'd given their youth and life and love and as soon as it was over, they were no longer needed and all the rhetoric of praise diminished. Um, it's so telling about human nature. Um, it will make you love. It's one of the greatest love stories told in this book. Um, but it's not necessarily a love story, it's a memoir. Honestly, the love story in this, whew, it is the most one of the most moving I've ever read, especially as it's real as well. I just want to give you just one poem to give you the pathos um, of, of this book. She's just quoting another poet. Imagine saying this about those whom you've sent to war. Perhaps someday the sun will shine again, and I shall see that still the skies are blue, and feel once more I do not live in vain, although bereft of you. Perhaps the golden meadows of my feet will make the sunny hours of spring seem gay, and I shall find the white may blossom sweet, though you have passed away. Perhaps the summer woods will shimmer bright, and crimson roses once again be fair, and autumn harvest fields a rich delight, although you are not there. But though kind time may many joys renew, there is one greatest joy I shall not know, again because my heart for loss of you was broken long ago. And the book is full of those kind of sentiments. It is just charming and it's grown and grown on me, but it's still only third in my list of books. My second most favourite classic on my list of five for 2023 was also in our Patreon community. And again, lots and lots of members really love the style of writing in this. Again, a very slow and thought provoking, um, but very stirring and moving, awakening kind of book. And it's A Room With A View by E.M. Forster. E.M. Forster is a magnificent writer. Um, he had so much repression of his own feelings in his life and it comes out in his writing and he understands the inhibitions of society quite profoundly. But he has a pen and a mind of words that can capture those thoughts. What I particularly love about this book is how many memories it gave me that are not my own. Scenes so charged, like the first time you kiss, you know, that kind of thing, or the first time you brush against someone that maybe you're attracted to, and you cannot ever forget it. Um, memories like in childhood, you know, it's those kind of moments. I didn't have them and yet they sit in my mind as if they're my own memories. And that is just an exquisite skill. Not many people can do that. So the story itself follows uh, the, the protagonist, Lucy, who is a young girl, Edwardian society, and she's doing the grand tour. She's sort of upper middle class. And this is the done thing. You go and educate yourself by going around Europe. But of course, it's very much like Kitty in, in A Painted Veil. She's not having an affair with anyone and she's not as obnoxious as Kitty is at, at the beginning. But she is so ass certain, assured, that the British way of doing things, the Empire's way, is the correct way. And every other civilization and culture is beneath them, including the Italians, whom she thinks are a little bit dirty and a little bit rough around the edges. But there's a charm. But what they really go for is the Renaissance work. She's in Florence and she's got a book which tells her all about the different bits of architecture and paintings and why you should appreciate this one and that one. It's very rigid. But she meets at the small hotel that she stays at, which also is designed to be as English as possible, which is strange since you're trying to culture yourself 
by going out of England. She meets a, a, an old man whom she finds fascinating and his son George. This is who the picture is, it's George and Lucy on the front, so it turned into a wonderful film. Now George is avant-garde to say the best, to say the least I should say. Um, he's quite um, a dismal character in many respects, that typical brooding chap that if in genre fiction a girl will fall in love with, but this is very realist and modern. This is very modern. Um, Lucy can't help but be repulsed by his behaviour because he breaks so many of the norms, but at the same time significantly intrigued by him. And it's her awakening, and it's her opening of her mind to see, beyond the painted veil really, um, that life is much more beautiful than what is held just in the books, and seeing it and agreeing with the traditional views of what is life and what is worthy and not. But there's so many great scenes in this. There is a, a, an incident of a murder that takes place. It's a little street attack, and there's a huge change in her because she's been exposed to this dramatic moment. Now, it's not lingered on for any length of time, but it is a pivotal moment, and you, it fixes in your mind. There's a moment shortly after where her and George, and again, she's not too fond of George at this point, they stare into a river watching the water go by together, and there's a moment she feels uncomfortable with because evidently there's a that that vibe that there's a, a, a liking of one another somehow but she's unfamiliar there is later a scene with an italian lad driving the cart to take them up to a view over florence and he's took along his his peasant girlfriend and they're talking in italian and and how the the vicar that's with them thinks it's totally inappropriate and but there's a charm about that, a vivacity, an acceptance of life, a carpe diem kind of thing. Um, and then a scene where she comes through a woods into a glade of violets, only to find George standing there alone, unexpected. That sticks with you. Later they come home. There's a scene where George and a very uh, uh, Mr. Beeb, he's a vicar as well, they go swimming in a pond. It's so funny but it's captured so well that just the pure joy, the, the inhibitions taken away of a human being for the moment, of the strictures of society, and you just live like young boys again, like children again. The, I can still see the golden spray coming out of the pool as they splash one another. I can still see their underclothes laid out in the rushes um, before they come out of the pool and get found by a group of passing women. The memories are beautiful. And what it does more than anything else, it makes you want to go for a walk and say, I must embrace life. Let me open my eyes and see it. That's what this book gives you. Fabulous piece of work. So here's the number one book of 2023 for me. And of course, it's a very close run thing. And this book may actually surprise any of you who have read it because I recently had in another comment um, uh, on another video, a comment about this book, which said that ugh, it was dull and dreary. And it certainly is dreary. And the atmosphere is gray and dull or somewhere betwixt gray and slate blue, but it's haunting and magnificent in its atmosphere, in its capturing of what it really must have been like to live as a German citizen in Germany during the Second World War. Not during the bombing, but at the beginning, under the ever-present menace of that single word, Gestapo. And the book is Alone in Berlin by Hans Fallida. Now, what a book this is. There is a whole cast of characters. I'll tell you the story in a moment. But there's a whole cast of characters, including a member of the Gestapo. Um, but this is not a book where all of their lives slowly crisscross and then the denouement pulls it all together. The strings of the people's lives in this book, although some crisscross and match into each other, they are all separate strands, that it is still people just living their life. 
um, and we happen to see where it occasionally intersects. One of the chief lessons I got from this book, or senses, uh, there was two main ones, but the first one was the sense of isolation. How you can be isolated in a city full of people when you're worried to share your innermost thoughts, when you're not allowed to communicate your own feelings because of the ever-present threat of the Gestapo or of overzealous Nazis in the neighborhood who will dob you in, who will report on you. Um, how fanaticism, when it gets hold and tries to say this is how things must be, the crippling effect it has on the rest of the world. Um, it's, it's truly tremendous what Valada manages to get in this book. So I'll tell you the story and some of the characters. It basically, you've got Otto and Anna Quangle, and they have a son who's joined German, the, the Wehrmacht, um, the German army, and was involved in the invasion of France in 1940, and he's been shot dead. And now they're an older couple, and now they're just sat in their apartment um, in Jablonski Strass, which is a set of apartments that have different families in. Otto doesn't talk much. It's quite infuriating for his wife. She wants to talk, but he's just a quiet man. He's, a, he's sort of a foreman at a local factory. And they become angry over the Fuhrer killing their son, that he had to die just because of Hitler's agenda and ideology. Now, what do you do in a situation like that? How do you put up a resistance? Do you have the moral fiber to try and make a difference in some way. The genius of this book is that Otto and Anna's method of fighting the regime is so insignificant. It's the equivalent of watching a group of ants excavating some soil beneath Mount Rushmore, Mount Everest, whatever, to make a little nest. The amount of grains they finally move is nothing compared to the mountain, not even you can't even notice it. Because what they do is they decide to write some little postcards with divisive messages on. Now, if I could just skim through this book, I should be able to come across one somewhere. Here's an example of what they would write on a postcard. Have you still not understood that the Fuhrer was lying to you when he claimed Russia was arming for a surprise attack on Germany? That's it. What Anna and Otto do is they take these little snippets and they find an apartment building or a government, not a government building, but you know, a public building. And when the coast is clear, Otto will drop one down, maybe on a stairwell where someone's going to find it, lift it up and read it. And that's all they can do. They're not cut out for a major resistance group. Um, they're older, you could say, and unconfident. But they have something to say. They want to show their little bit of resistance, even if it makes not much of a difference. But of course, these little postcards start turning up and you have um, the Gestapo start to investigate. Um, a particular detective, Escherich, is the one who takes it up. And he has to answer to a vehement Nazi, Obergruppenführer Prahl, who's demanding results because he, he actually can't quite work out who's doing this thing with the postcards. Slowly you see him work out the pattern and you watch the net drawing in. Amongst all of that as your main theme there are different characters. You have the Persics who live across the way from the Quangles. The Persics are Nazis and their youngest son um, whose name escapes me right now he is really vehement. He's one of the Hitler Jugend. So you live in that perpetual fear, fear of being reported. Also in that apartment block, there is, um, oh, what's his name, Enno Kluger, I think his name is. He's a coward um, and he keeps getting out of going to war because he's always ill somehow. And yet he has a way with the ladies and he's got a group of women around Berlin whom he, he tries to use and they give him money and they support him. You know, he's a real waster. Um, and you see his life maneuver. But it's not tied to Otto and Anna at all. It's just his life happens to crisscross with them. And then you have others like Trudel Bauman. Now, she was 
engaged to the Quangle's son. But because he's now dead, she sort of drifts to one side, but she wants to resist in some respects. So you see her. The, the moments in the factory when he's foreman, and he's aware of his own guilt of leaving these messages, but he's also aware of what others may be thinking, how some hate the war effort and, and the, the regime, but how there are others there who are vehemently for the Nazi, the pro-fascism. You know, the suppression you feel of everybody. And then there's another family as well in the apartment block. Is, is a guy who just can't keep his kids in control. His, his wife, she sleeps around with everybody. Um, you sense that's how she keeps up a bit of their income. Um, and he's got all these kids who he doesn't even know are his, and he doesn't really care about them. And you've got, you know, he, he comes across some money by accident and how that's stolen by his own children. That's his life. And ever present is the Gestapo on all of them. But it's not a team of jackboots coming up the street and surrounding a house and bursting in or lorries coming along with stormtroopers. None of that. It's just the ever present threat of Gestapo. And it's haunting. It's absolute. Like I say, it's just this blue gray scene from beginning to end and various aspects of the Reich just working. But it's, it's not about uh, the Jews escaping. It's not about a massive resistance movement. It's not about, you know, a soldier fighting for it and becoming captured. It's not about a prisoner of war. It's about the ordinary, most insignificant people trying to do something, even for their own morality or conscience, to stand up against an awful regime. You have to read it to know how it ends. None of the characters in this book are perfect by any means. They are all flawed, massively. And that's what makes it so beautiful. It's, it certainly was, Alone in Berlin, Hans Fallader's book, certainly was the number one book I read last year. Just to say, would I recommend it? Yes and no. You see, it's hard to recommend books because you've got to be looking or prepared to take on this kind of book. I'm not saying you have to be intelligent, not at all. Most classics you don't need any intelligence for. You just need them to know how to approach certain books, that some books are not written to enthrall, to entertain per se. Um, they are entertaining if you approach them in the right way, but they are to search you through. They ask you to go through some passages which doesn't seem like much is happening, as the other commenter said, dull and dreary, because the author wants to make you feel the oppressive weight of society. If everything was permanent action, you would go away thinking, oh, I wish I had been there during the Nazi regime, so I could have got in on all that action. That's not how life was. You were suffocated in your neighbourhood. Um, but that he can get so much thrill and sense of danger, it's not thrill, sense of danger from such an innocuous, bland character doing the most trivial of things in resistance, leaving small cards on stairwells. It's just, ah, oh, I will read this again. I didn't even mention that it's written in third person, present tense, which gives you a fly on the wall kind of look into things. Um, and also means because it's present tense, you get a sense, um, I wondered why I felt this about this book, that the, the narration style really struck me as bang on, right. Yet it's not a style I would have picked. I would have, doing this, if I'd gone into a book like this, I probably would have used third person omniscient. Try maybe to be unreliable a little bit, but omniscient nonetheless. Um, however, that using of the present tense is slightly leaves you off balance, but it gives you more of a sense of threat and suspicion and being caught because you are doing it at the moment it's happening. You're walking through it, not as it's being recounted, but you're there. So the path hasn't been finished yet and you've got to walk along. However, there is a comment uh, right towards the end, which doesn't give anything away, I might say. Um, But it is really important. It's really important. You can miss this the first time through. Um, because of 
you know, the oppression and the feeling of death that is involved in Germany and everything. Don't worry, not everyone dies. There's various outcomes for everybody. But it says here, but we don't want to end this book with death, thinking of the war and everything around. Dedicated as it is to life, invincible life, life always triumphing over humiliation and tears, over misery and death. So when people say it's dull and dreary, I get what they mean by tone. But the book actually is hopeful if you read it through and think about it. So those were my five favorite classic reads of 2023. I hope that you've enjoyed them. Now, not everyone would have made it to the end of this video, but if you have, I just wanna let you in on something and ask you your opinion on something. I've been asked repeatedly in comments and private messages, what other books I read other than classics. And although I was thinking about doing a video covering some modern books, I'm asked regularly, what am I reading now? And being as my channel is about the classics, it would be incongruous for me to keep putting on modern books here. One video, okay, but I wouldn't be able to keep you updated. So my thought, how would you like this? is to set up a separate YouTube channel. Don't worry, it will not impact on this one. This one will keep going because classics are my passion. But another YouTube channel where I simply review the, the books that I'm reading, the modern books that I'm reading outside of the classics. Other stories, mainly novels, I do read nonfiction, but I'll focus on the novels, um, which are modern. How would you like it if I set that up? Would you come and support me? If no one's gonna come and support me, I won't do it. Um, because it's a lot of work, <laughs> but I don't mind doing it for book lovers um, and I'm happy to talk about all books, not just the classics. So uh, let me know in the comments down below. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and if you're a member or if you already are subscribed, share this video with any book groups that you're in, please. That helps me no end. Links to my Patreon are down below if you'd like to support my channel and until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.